um, to this uh, fight between them, this interaction, which leads to victories and defeats, and they can be seen across spatial and temporal scales. So this is part of uh, some of my work where I suggest that uh, the different biomes shape the different functional communities, and there are several factors that will switch their activities on and off. It's like a switch light. So any alteration on these systems that will alter also these functionalities. Um, everybody has heard about this uh, so far report that has been uh, launched recently. Uh, I was involved as a, one of the 300 scientists, but I also been involved in another report, which is highlighting why soils are at risk. And these are some of the threats to these European soils. I'm highlighting from this report the, the five of them, uh, which are the soil organic matter decline, soil compactation and soil sealing, soil erosion and degradation, soil contamination, and health. And they are all caused by change in land use and climate change. And what I'm going to do is to tackle every single of these problems using soil organisms as a solution. Here in the talk, we have heard the scientists and how important biodiversity is, but I'm going to try to give you some quantitative facts. So unfortunately, the fight we know all these uh, threats, uh, the protection of soil invertebrates has clearly been a criterion for regulating land use changes and in climate change mitigation policy. So I will start with the first problem, the climate soil organic carbon. Well, the soils in the European Union have been losing organic carbon, 10% uh, of weight, uh, future projections, are quite pessimistic and they reckon that between 10 to 40 percent of croplands and 6 to 10 percent of grasslands are, uh, are going to lose carbon. So how here comes the solution? Actually, soil organisms produce uh, 25,000 kilograms of organic matter per year. So that's the weight of 25 car. This is another of my research papers where we saw that if we tilt the balance towards fungi in the fungal bacteria ratios, we are able to sequester more carbon in our soil. And this is another work I produced for a chapter for a EU project where I saw that soil organisms, they produce aggregates. Um, it could be plants, it could be microbes, but it could also be fauna. And those aggregates, which are biogenic, they sequester organic matter, they protect the organic matter. Another problem I highlighted before is soil compactation and soil sealing. Intensive agricultural practice, especially with heavy machinery and the urban development are causing that our soil decreases in porosity. Um, I'm assuming you are very familiar with the plot bank that is produced by the compactation by tractors and things, and these will compact layers, it could be several of them, they impair, prevent the, the root growth. And then we also have urban areas, and we put a lot of concrete around the world, and apparently it's not correlated to uh, human population. Uh, according to the European Environmental Agency, uh, the surface for cities has increased by 78%, but the population has only grown a smaller percentage of that. And around 500 kilometers square of land are seen annually, according to the report I created before. So a solution would be, for, for example, to increase the number of Edwards. Edwards produce, uh, there is in a healthy soil that we could have an estimated abundance density of 100 to 800 per square meter. They produce calories and they increase water infiltration. And average estimates indicate that approximately 150 millimeters of water can be infiltrated per hour per the lowest estimate of this density. So I did some calculations for agricultural soils where I have F1 data for conventional 
and not chill systems. And uh, according to my results, we can increase water infiltration by threefold, by threefold by not chill if we don't apply convention. And if we remove the ones from the soil, we can also remove uh, prevent water infiltration by 90%. There's a huge impact. Another big problem in Europe in soil is soil erosion. According to one of my colleagues, panel, 75% of the EU land has an erosion rate that is higher than the recommended uh, threshold, which is two tons per hectare per annum. And more than 60% of our future land suffer from a high erosion. So they are losing the soil, and that's where the organism can fight. These are uh, glomalin uh, proteins that are produced by microorganisms. Um, they glue the soil particles, so they glue together, so they are more resilient to erosion. And here on this side, we have another example of NQ trays surrounded by uh, pellets that also aggregate particles. And then here we have a, a, a cast by everyone. And the same for contamination, we call it bioremediation, which is the uh, using plants or fungi to clean the soils. But soil organisms can also be the canneries in the coal mine, and that is called bioindication. And here we have some ISO guidelines, which are produced by OECD guidelines using columbola, nematodes, incubators, and um, everyone to tell us when we are on higher risk to have a very contaminated soil. So all these problems lead to land degradation. And yesterday we heard uh, Wim van der Putin saying that we have uh, many services provided by soil biodiversity. And when, yeah, when we increase the, the, the production, we see positive uh, productive, but all the services get reduced. So the most intense, the more the less services we get by soil biodiversity. And that is the same for human health. We throw lots of pesticides that affect the soil microbiome and that increases uh, is linked to public health. So um, now we are in a pandemic area, 70% of the um, diseases and pandemics are in considered to be zoonotic and maybe soil organisms could help. So this is my last slide. Policies to protect value and value soil biodiversity are still in an early stage and need to, to be further implemented. And this is a recent study that shows how the European Union has invested in soil and in biodiversity. And as we can see, they put more money, six times more money in vertebrates than invertebrates. rates. So that has Sorry, been... is, uh, we are 10 minutes now. Okay. If you can conclude so very quickly. Thing, my take home message is that uh, we need to protect soil biodiversity. This is possible and sustainable manage to have to include soil biodiversity. So thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I had the, the microphone muted and I couldn't uh, ad advise you that okay. you were. Okay, so I'm very sorry. Thank you very much for this uh, overall. Uh, um, uh, view of biodiversity roles. Thank you very much. And now I want to introduce uh, Mr. Fornasier from uh, Italy, uh, who will uh, deliver a presentation titled Soil Biodiversity, Soil Biodiversity Pro Cultural Production and Environmental Integrity. Uh, so Flavio, you are here. Ah, yes, you are. Um, uh, please, Julia, unmute Flavio Fornasier. Uh, what is, I don't see his name in the. I see him. Is a uh, six five seven four two six. Okay. Uh, please rename yourself, Flavio. So. Yes, Flavio, you are named as a number. Six five seven four two six, okay. and so Julia couldn't find your. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can you very hear much. me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. I uh, will. I will uh, send you an advice at uh, nine minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Um, uh, can you uh, load? Sorry, I have some problems with the. Okay, why not? Okay, I, I cannot see uh, the. Um, uh, okay, now uh, it's okay. Okay. Um, can you load my uh, presentation by the organizer? Is it possible? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to start? Can I start? Yeah. Yes. Thank okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, next uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, now um, with the, my presentation, I will uh, uh, show you how we. Um, uh, depicted the um, the action of the microorganism in uh, at the ecosystem uh, the ecosystem uh, level. Um, next slide, please. Uh, when we investigate uh, at ecosystem level, the the micro the, sorry when we investigate the um, microorganism and their action, we have we can uh, uh, use different tools. First of all. Uh, we can use genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. These techniques generate an enormous data set, and possibly with the possibility to get uh, of getting drowned in such a notion of data, and possibly conclude at last the difference among samples are very uh, small. This is so they are very. Uh, time consuming, produce a lot of data and, uh, and moreover, this is not simple to interpret um, correctly and uh, with the, um, give a proper interpretation of the, of the data. Uh, because when we have a list of uh, operational taxonomic units, for instance, we are not able to connect directly to the function of the the functioning um, of the sing of the and the action of the single um, micro microbe or microbial group for the uh, in, in their environment by contrast we have time and cost effective high throughput techniques which are multiplex enzyme sa double strand based uh, quantitation of soil microbial biomass and assessment of intracellular and uh, uh, extracellular DNA. Next slide, please. And this is an example uh, of our approach. We analyzed the uh, um, climate sequence, uh, which is in, uh, in the northern Italy, uh, in the Trentino region, in uh, the so-called Val di Rabi. You can, you can see here uh, a map. Uh, of the of this uh, site, um, this uh, this sites that no, uh, are not different uh, with respect to the state factors. So it means that the parent material is the same. The forest we have the forest time of the same type, and the land use we have also natural grassland, and the soil type is can be sold to umbrasol or podsols. We have different sites that uh, are. Um, uh, north uh, exposure at north and the south with different which are different for the climate next slide please well we have north facing slopes and south facing slopes and we, you can see that the altitude for uh, we have a pair of uh, uh, sampling sites which are at more or less at the same altitude uh, we had the, um, we sampled 10 sites, uh, each of one had the three soil depth, three independent field replicates means more or less plots and five sub samples. This equals 450 soil samples. Next slide, please. Uh, when we use uh, uh, high throughput methods, we need, we have, uh, mm, we need uh, um, proper statistical approach and tools because we have a huge amount of data. 
here is an example of what uh, the, the method we used, uh, the uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling or in this uh, example is for soil enzymatic activities and microbial uh, biomass content of the soil, which is just, um, and so the different size are uh, um, outlined by, um, are separated with this uh, technique. So uh, what I, I want to, to tell you is that when you have a lot of, uh, this is known, but uh, with a, such a, a huge amount of data, we need a proper um, statistic tool to um, evidence the differences and similarities. Um, next slide, please. And these are uh, the results. In the, um, in the north uh, exposure, we have more volatile soil, solids, uh, more soil, higher soil moisture, more clay and electrical conductivity, uh, mineral nitrogen, uh, high, uh, higher carbon, uh, organic carbon uh, content, and uh, a higher activity of beta glucosidase and acid phosphomonoesterase, and this is uh, connected to, to a lower pH. And uh, we have also a higher uh, substrate-induced respiration-based um, uh, microbial biomass, a higher basal respiration, and from um, looking at the microbial groups, we had a higher archaeal uh, abundance. By contrast, there was no difference about the um, esterase activity, chitinase, and microbial biomass uh, as measured as double strand DNA. And, but, and fungal abundance was more or less the same in the north or uh, exposure or in the south. South, we have a higher bulk density, a higher pH, and um, an activity of uh, a higher activity of lysine aminopeptidase which is uh, an enzyme linked to the nitrogen cycle. A higher alkaline phosphomonoesterase, phosphodiesterase, aryl sulfatase, and a higher bacterial abundance. So this, um, the results, uh, these results are um, good to depict the, 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 and forecast what could be uh, the, um, the result of uh, climate change. So this uh, results could be helpful for, to predict future scenarios in, ma in ma obviously in mountain ecosystem. Next slide, please. So we had a comprehensive, comprehensive picture of both microbiota and the complexity of biochemical cycling. So the, uh, it means also the, um, uh, functionality of the soil and uh, we achieved by next generation sequencing a huge very detailed data set and specific information for each sample but uh, also with the high throughput methods with the extracellular and intracellular DNA ratio double strain DNA uh, uh, microbial biomass and multiplex enzyme assay which are able to process hundreds of samples in a very short time at a minimal cost. These are not uh, an alternative, uh, uh, these methods are not alternative to the, um, for instance, next generation sequencing or uh, uh, proteomics and, uh, and others, but are, uh, are um, high-end, uh, um, sorry, are um, a tool to select uh, samples for deeper analysis, so to evidence difference among soils. Our experience with uh, tens of uh, publications evidence that uh, if any difference exists at the, uh, in functionality, they are easily evidenced for the uh, with the multiplex enzyme assay, which means that at the same time we are able to uh, assay as many as uh, twenty five enzyme activities. One minute. Okay. Thank you. I've finished. Thank you very much. Uh, 
what uh, I want to stress at is that we need uh, uh, with, with such investigation, we need a, um, a suitable straight, uh, not only a specific um, statistical tool, but also a sampling strategy, um, sampling strategy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for staying in time. And uh, I now want to introduce Mr. Bender from Switzerland, uh, who is going to deliver a presentation titled Soil Biodiversity for Agricultural Production and Environmental Integrity. So Mr. Bender, you have the floor if you are somewhere. Thank you, I'm here, just trying to share my presentation. Thank you very much. Right. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, okay. clear. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I will talk about soil biodiversity for agricultural production and environmental integrity. So we all know that there's a whole range of organisms living below ground and they, um, through their activities, provide different ecosystem functions and ecosystem services that we as a human society depend on for survival. And we also know that uh, with increasing uh, um, agricultural intensification, um, yeah, a lot of these organisms are negatively affected and uh, this intensive agricultural management can actually lead to the local extinction of some of these organism groups. So the question is, if we lose these organisms, do we also lose these crucial functions and services that we depend on? Um, so this for, yeah, is basically the, maze, the main question of my research. So I want to, to frame it um, within the scope of this um, uh, yeah, conceptual framework here. When we look at a natural um, system, we usually have a relatively high plant diversity, a high soil biodiversity, and we have efficient resource recycling processes that maintain the system for, for long periods of time. Uh, so the system is sustainable, but not very productive in agricultural terms. When we compare this to an intensive agricultural system, um, we see yeah, we, we, we often have crop monocultures and a high level of external resource inputs, which has negative effects on soil communities. So the internal resource recycling processes are less well developed and we have higher nutrient losses through leaching or gases emissions. And um, yeah, overall we have a productive system, but it's not very sustainable. So the ideal system would be, um, yeah, a sustainable system with an intermediate level of plant diversity and a high level of soil biodiversity and efficient resource recycling processes. And uh, so we need less external resource inputs and we also have little nutrient losses. So we have a productive and sustainable system. But first we need to find out what are soil organisms actually capable, capable of. So um, I want to present you this model system that we conducted this experiment and we made use of lysimeters, which are actually big pots um, on the plain air. We filled these lysimeters with sterilized soil and inoculated them with two different soil communities, an enhanced soil life with organisms smaller four millimeters and a reduced soil life that contained organisms only smaller than 11 micrometers. These lysimeters have a hole in the bottom so we can collect uh, soil water running through the soil profile and analyze it for nutrients. Um, and then we also performed measurements of gases emissions of nitrous oxide and N2. So we planted a maize crop into these lysimeters and let them grow to maturity so they became big plants. And then we looked at yield parameters and nutrient losses. So looking at the yields, we found here the gray bars, the dark bars, uh, the, the treatments with enhanced soil life. We found that crop yield was significantly higher with the enhanced soil life compared to the reduced soil life. And so was crop nitrogen uptake and phosphorus uptake. Looking at the soil nutrient losses, we found the opposite pattern with enhanced soil life. Nitrate leaching was 
strongly reduced compared to the reduced soil life treatment and also the emissions of nitrous oxide gas and N2 gas were much lower. So these are compelling results that show the potential that soil biota have for crop production and um, yeah, nutrient cycling. But this is a model system and we need to find out does this also apply to the real world? So this is a study I performed at a research day in, at the University of California, Davis. And um, here we looked at a, a gradient of increasing management intensity in the field from grasslands to extensive rotations with cover crops and compost and intensive rotations that just receive uh, mineral inputs and no organic inputs. So we analyzed soil communities in all these fields and extracted undisturbed soil cores, put them in a greenhouse, planted tomato plants on there to assess ecosystem functions. And uh, looking at the first data for, for soil communities, um, we, we always have an increase in management intensity from left to right, grassland here, intensive systems here. Um, yeah, we see that overall there's a negative trend with increasing management intensity. We find lower abundance and diversity of soil biota. For the ecosystem functions, the pattern is less clear. We see here for nitrate leaching, we see an increase with management intensity, but for yield and N2O emissions, it's less clear. But when we correlate measures of, um, yeah, soil communities, to ecosystem functions. So here we have a correlation of the microbial biomass in the soil with tomato yield. We found a significant positive relationship here. The more microbial biomass, the more tomato yield. Um, also the abundance of nematodes was positively related to, to crop yields. And um, the amount of nitrate leached from the soil was negatively related to the ratio of fungi to bacteria in soil. So overall, we find indications that actually what we found in our model system also applies to the real world. Now I present a third experiment, um, a factorial experiment where we focus on a vascular mycorrhizal fungi, a group of beneficial soil fungi that form associations with the plants and can have many benefits for the plants. And um, we made use of this long-term field trial in Davis, California, where different agricultural management, management systems are compared since 25 years. And we were interested in how does this long-term agricultural management affect the communities of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and the ecosystem functions they provide. So we selected four different crop rotations, some organic, some conventional, and we planted this tomato mutant system in there, which consists of a regular tomato plant that forms associations with mycorrhizal fungi and then this mutant that does not form associations with mycorrhizal fungi. So we can basically knock out the contribution of, of mycorrhizal fungi to crop yield. So when we look at the data here, this is the abundance of the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. These are the different management systems. And we see that the system actually worked. In the wild type, we find higher abundance of mycorrhizal fungi compared to the mutant system. And uh, yeah, we found differences in abundance according to the management system. And looking at the yield, we find a similar pattern. When we knock out mycorrhizal fungi, yield goes down. And uh, yeah, so with this, we, we found that actually up to 33% of tomato yield um, is supported through mycorrhizal fungi. So when we lose mycorrhizal fungi, we might actually lose um, yeah, quite a lot of our crop yields. So to summarize, um, over these three different studies, a model system, a field survey, and a factorial field experiment, we found that soil biota can make a substantial contribution to agricultural yields and reduce environmental impacts. So now the question is, how can we spread the news um, about this, make society and uh, politics and stakeholders aware of these benefits of soil biodiversity? So for this, we, we launched a citizen science project in Switzerland called Beweisstück Unterhose, which is, uh, yeah, means basically proof by underpants. So we make use of these soil your undies um, principle where you bury cotton underpants in the soil and the faster they get decomposed, the better is your soil and the more active is your soil life. And uh, so we made a call to the Swiss public um, 
to participate in this project. And we have more than 1,000 participants that registered. Here you see a map of, of all the um, participants where they're spread all over the country. And we will send um, standardized underpants to all the participants. They all get two underpants that will um, yeah, excavate it from the soil after different time points. And we hope to, to get an overview of the soil biological activity over Switzerland and scientifically assess the potential of underpants to serve as an indicator for, for soil quality, soil health. And um, yeah, also to engage the public and to make them aware of the importance of soil and of soils as a living system. And the good thing is the media love it. So we, we just launched the, the project and we've got media coverage all over Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and even in Ghana and India and on Al Jazeera, we um, had articles. So yeah, this is actually very nicely. And we hope through this project, um, we will be able to give soils and soil organisms the attention they deserve. And with this, uh, yeah, I come to the end. I want to thank a lot of people that were involved in this research and the funding organizations that enable us to do this. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very, very nice uh, uh, experience uh, with the Science Citizen. My best compliments. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I want to call um, Mr. Yoshi from India, who is giving a, a presentation titled Participatory Learning Action is Important for Community Action to Improve Soil Biodiversity. So, Mr. Yoshi. Mr. Mr. Yoshi, are you I, present? My screen, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you share your presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah. First, I would like to thanks to um, FAO. For the giving the chance uh, to grassroot level uh, research action and showing the grassroot level research action uh, action research uh, at the global symposium on the soil biodiversity and after two uh, change, date changes uh, ultimately we are here so um, uh, welcome to all of you uh, just i want to share the organization uh, which is try to um, uh, uh, with the tribal uh, region, India, Western India, on the livelihood, even the changing climate situation, their children are at par with the other on all development parameters like education, health, rights, and participation. The basically, uh, the organization mis uh, mission is the um, empowering, uh, um, creating and nurturing vibrant institution of the indigenous community, and that uh, this part of India who can uh, uh, serve the appropriate scientific uh, and indigenous technology for sustainable livelihood and realizing uh, climate uh, uh, for childhood and children by 2020. So basically, uh, this is the map of India and you can see this uh, tri-junction of the um, indigenous people, uh, tribal area of the India, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, we participate, uh, the community um, uh, take action uh, at that area. The, uh, some glimpse of the soil, uh, land and soil in the area, um, the tribal area and uh, unreachable area is also um, not safe, uh, just we want to share here. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, the living soil uh, need to community action in India, government policies and investment on the watershed development, soil water conservation measure have tried to protect its vast degraded lands in upper reach to some extent against the process of the soil erosion in certain schemes. But due to the lack of integrated approach and community action involvement, results are not very effective on the front of the soil health and soil biodiversity. That is the challenge. 
uh, demand from the company have um, uh, tribal community have their um, uh, diversity they have their um, uh, component for integration uh, soil water livestock vegetation but certain policies and certain action uh, action and market driven uh, um, action is reducing the um, uh, soil health the basically uh, now uh, we are sharing here a community based uh, participatory learning action um, uh, develop a test and appli uh, applicability of the participatory um, learning action tools and consolidate uh, this learning in the form of framework that could be the used to facilitate the wider adoption of the living soil in the agriculture that is quite important for entire area the step followed for the um, uh, process is a pla tool the community consultation and literature review assessing the traditional farming uh, system evolve the pla framework from the community and farming system test pla framework with its tools so basically it's a, a five phase first phase is the formulation formulation foundation building second phase is the soil for the community and community for soil identifying the deciding community action that is the important because the entire process done by the community assessing the action uh, interval and consolidating uh, consolidating learning after the whole process uh, completing so first foundation phase the worship soil the mother earth the indigenous people uh, uh, created a uh, uh, created a bridge between the community practice and uh, thought process of uh, vagdhara uh, we try to uh, uh, usually indigenous people is uh, um, always uh, soil is a worship uh, they ask as the mother earth for them so vagdara try to um, uh, establish the connection identifying uh, identifying the resource based utilizing by the each family the linking uh, access to resources within the farming system how the soil can help the livelihood and community perception on the soil that is the important many people is the usually uh, ask as a god in the soil in the tribe uh, indigenous area so why that is god uh, so uh, that was the important so this exercise was carried out uh, in the very first pla session served to the trigger action um, uh, and uh, interest in participants who expressed the urge to deepen in the link between the local farming and food system so um, uh, that was the um, uh, different posters how the soil biodiversity can map uh, biodiversity in the soil this is the food it's indian word uh, hindi uh, it's called uh, the uh, food is here uh, we show the food is here not here um, uh, so soil type and crop diversity relationship that was the important the identifying dec uh, declining community uh, action is the third phase uh, listing the traditional action for the soil health selection of the community action and assessing the community actions the assessing the actions uh, um, uh, basically uh, um, like uh, this is the diversity mapping how they can understand about the earthworms and um, uh, in uh, their own practice this one is the live hedge for their community so that is the important how community can uh, this uh, just the capturing the visible diversity in the soil the production diversity praying worship mother, as a mother earth of the soil so uh, this is uh, this one is the entire thousand um, uh, villages in the uh, western part of india the near about one lakh uh, families participate in this uh, uh, world soil day uh, for the uh, as a um, uh, praise uh, about the soil um, saving so basically outcome of the this uh, research is the uh, a community of uh, 600 indigenous women learned to link soil health with the practice and farming system 30 groups participate in the contributing overall validity of these tools for the uh, for evolve and implementation process the pla have the identifying factors that either hinder or the enable soil biodiversity the process uh, 
broaden and the community understanding on the various traditional farming practices and uh, revitalizing the process of the li uh, living soil particularly with the tribal community because uh, the vagdhara and our community is always believe um, uh, if anyone can uh, um, save the soil is the only and only indigenous community who save the soil because they live with the soil seed water and vegetation till now so community level finding is the um, uh, basically pla not only helped achieve the soil biodiversity but also helped in the production diversity participating families earned a, uh, a higher income compared the other um, uh, compared to what they used to earn when they produced crop based on the market preferences uh, that pla approaches providing a scope of the innovation by farming communities such as the inclusion of the legumes mixed cropping uh, to act as a natural fertilizer, crop rotation, crop uh, agroforestry, and mulching, um, natural mulching. The critical role of the government is the deciding the fate of the land quality, soil health, soil biodiversity, farming system, nutrition, and the farmer well-being. The farmer plays a crucial role in the protecting soil biodiversity, since their choice of the tools of the techniques has an enormous influence on the factory of the life. Adoption of the uh, PLA approach through involvement with the indigenous farming community. One experience, minute, uh, Mr. Joshua. Uh, so only just last slide, the experience of the demonstration, the potential uh, for the applying the approach of the community action is in the effective mechanism to protect uh, one of the world largest resource best sustained and oldest occupation of the farming. The community action in the revival of the living soil can help achieve the SDGs in particular as disease two on zero hunger it can also help to address the problem of the malnourishment through the local solution so just i want to share here the that major discussion happened in this uh, different community involvement in the large number of traditional practices have to take the appropriate actions and involvement of policies worldwide to evolve the program to wider involvement of the community in the soil building process so just i want to share here uh, the, uh, this is the future agenda of Vagdara. Uh, 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 before the thanking you, uh, just I want to urge in this uh, platform and forum, the community action and community um, efforts is only and only uh, solution for uh, the soil biodiversity, maintaining the soil biodiversity and saving the soil. Thank you uh, for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for this experience uh, of uh, participatory learning uh, across. In. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have unfortunately only six minutes for question and answer. And uh, I collected uh, a couple. There was a third one in uh, in the chat, but was already answered uh, by the speaker. And one is uh, for uh, Mr. Flavio Fornasier. Um, and um, is, uh, the question is, uh, can next gen generation sequencing be involved in regular soil assessments that farmers do undertake? Would it be cost effective for them, given that it's also need to be analyzed by an expert? Uh, well, um, next generation sequencing is uh, quite expensive, but the most important uh, uh, what now could be uh, more or less you, you, you need 100 euros to sequence uh, all the fungus and the, um, and the bacteria and the oral archaea. The, the, the real problem now we are facing is that you are not able to translate the information about microbial composition to soil functionality. And so now we are studying and we are just starting to understand what is the link between functionality and microbial composition. Uh, thank you. And uh, there is another question for Mr. Bender. Uh, congratulations. And then uh, have you thought about increasing soil biodiversity in the intensive system by soil management options, for example? Uh, here in Sweden, we added uh, organic matter in the subsoil and recorded a several fold increase in microbial biomass and number of earthworms. Also, the yield increased by 5-10%. Mr. Yes. Bender. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so the, the fields that we investigated were actually farmer-managed fields, so we did not perform any operations on there. But um, 
of course, management is, is key to support and enhance biodiversity in agricultural systems. Um, I have thought about adding organic matter to the subsoil. It sounds very interesting. I'm just wondering how you get the subsoil, how to get the organic matter into down the there. But, <laughs> yeah, into the subsoil. Uh, there must Add be a forms. lot of... Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, there must be a lot of... Um, yeah. yeah. There's another of... question for you, uh, I think. Uh, because how long you left uh, underpants into the soil and how deep? Um, so we bury the underpants um, like vertically into the soil that the seam just looks out at the top. So they're from zero to 30 centimeters roughly in the soil and we leave them in for one month, the first underpant and then the second one will be retrieved after two months. So we have a, yeah, a timeline of the decomposition process. Uh, thank you. And another question for you. Uh, uh, she says, I work with soil, specifically rhizobial. Um, I work with soil inoculants. Do you think uh, we should work on improving them so that they can be used successfully in commercial agriculture instead of fertilizer? And it's a new technology, this one. Yeah, so that's actually also something we are uh, working on with mycorrhizal fungi producing inocula. For, for application in agriculture. I think it's definitely a promising um, approach, but I also think it cannot be the only approach to really, um, yeah, make a change. I think we, we need a holistic, holistic approach, adjust the entire management system to really support soil biodiversity. But applying inocula is certainly one important step that can help introduce beneficial organisms or reintroduce them. To the soil. So I wish to thank all the speakers and uh, now it's time to pass to the second slot of a presentation. So thank you very much to you all four. And um, yes, now we have, we have the second uh, part of our parallel session, still the same theme and uh, still the same rules. And uh, uh, yes, please feel free to uh, uh, write in the chat your questions. Uh, 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 maybe the speakers can answer to you directly or at the end of the session. So please, I wish to call uh, uh, and give the floor to Mr. Knebel uh, from uh, United States of America, who is presenting uh, a coordinating research at Temprise on agricultural soil microbiomes and soil ecosystems across USDA research locations. So, Mr. Nebel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here to this global soil meeting. Um, I'll be sharing my screen. So again, welcome. Um, the day and I appreciate the opportunity to share about what we're doing in the U.S. Department of Agriculture in soil microbiome research and in soil ecology and soil biodiversity. And what I want to do today is share some of our research efforts and talk a little bit about our organization. And I have two purposes for this um, talk is to talk about the global concerns. So that's why we're here um, it's not just a problem in the US or our own particular nations, but what we're trying to face and solve across the globe. And what we're trying to do in the Agricultural Research Service and how we're set up to do that, to understand the soil ecosystem and then improve productivity and improve the environment. And it's very important to us as a nation, but then also as a community member of how we can collaborate. And so I'm, I'm going to be providing some contact information and some activities where we wish to engage you and um, also invite you to invite us to participate in these global problems. So what I would like to do is share a little bit about how we are set up in the Agricultural Research Service. It's a very large organization and it has a number of diverse different types of applications to research. And after a short introduction of that, I will move into our soil ecosystem research, but just a very few snapshots of those. And it was hard for me to figure out which best way to take. So I'm gonna just snapshot a few of our research efforts out of hundreds currently going on, but, but thousands in history. 
We have four research program areas, and you can see the four there, um, natural resources, then in the crop production, food safety and quality, and then also animal production. That group is comprised of over 1,800 PhD scientists with a total of 8,000 total support staff. And I've likened those support staff and those teams, those, those scientist leaders, um, the leaders being sort of like endowed chairs at universities. They have full funding for five-year increments, and then that funding goes through review, and they get more funding um, support. And so they don't have to compete for grants, although they can, but their, their funding is supported for these five-year efforts. So it gives us really a wonderful opportunity to investigate problems on long-scale time periods. In the organization, there are approximately 690 projects across those four program areas and about a $1.4 billion budget. And for the US, we are located, I don't know if you can see the dots, we're located in approximately 90 different locations around the country. And this gives us a very diverse perspective on all of the different agricultural production systems in the nation. We also do partner extensively with our international partners, but these locations give us very different ecotypes to look at in different production systems and embedded within those are a number of soil ecosystem efforts. So again, I'll be sharing four efforts of uh, hundreds, and we're looking at how soil ecosystem management may improve yields, how they respond and may be resilient to climate stress, and how they enhance carbon sequestration. So I'm going to move on quickly. I'm going to dive in deeply, but this is what I call the ghost of soil management past. It's what did the previous cropping system do to the soil ecosystem, and how does it influence it? And so there's a greenhouse study done to evaluate historical rotations effects on disease resistance, and that looked at Fusarium graminearium. And the data are dense, and I'm going to summarize it. What do these plots mean? If you look on the far left top, you can see the previous crop impact on um, the particular, this is corn in this case, on the fungal communities. And these diverge along this line here with the sunflower and soybean on the lower left. And as it turns out, that increased productivity, those communities, because of their previous community, um, their previous um, cropping system, changed the soil microbiome in such that those fungal communities enhanced productivity. And then a field study, we looked at whether corn or wheat impacted um, the rhizosphere of a soybean production system. And here we haven't detangled yet what the impacts mean on the, the soybean productivity, but we definitely see a segregation on um, this, in this case, it's bacterial communities between the previous crop. So we're trying to understand this cropping system's impacts on the, the soil ecosystem. And then what we're trying to do is how does that impact um, the uh, productivity and nutrient yields? Another study, this was done across the United States. You can sort of see the yellow pins, the Soil Health Assessment Initiative. And we looked at the product systems or production systems in response to stress and other indicators using microbial sequences, looking at particular um, genetic assemblages. So you can see the bacterial genes and community abundances were correlated to soil health. And what we looked at were several different indicator types, soil organic matter composition, aggregation, nutrient cycling, and they can see the topics in the middle, what we're trying to find, and then what gene markers we use to assess those soils, and then also look at how the productivity was and their stress responses. We also looked at disease suppression, um, whether or not there are antibiotic genes being expressed, as well as stress resiliency, and how those were also being expressed in response to stress. And so the, the findings were in the study between ARS and the NRCS, that there are correlations between what we're seeing as far as the gene abundance and activity across these different locations and stress. Very large study as some of the speakers alluded to earlier. We're also, of course, wondering about stress and lack of rainfall and how that's affecting our crop production. So in this study using maize under full irrigation or limited irrigation, we see a divergence in the communities along this gradient from full irrigation to limited irrigation so we see the community changes and we're still not sure what this means as far as the impacts and how we can manage that, but that's the goal. And then my last slide is on what happens with deep carbon sequestration during an extreme drought and looking at different switchgrass stock types, different um, genotypes and finding what do they do to the soil microbial community. 
And so we use carbon-13 enrichment. We looked um, at a deep core process and a number of different markers for different types of genes. And what we found was in the two different types, the Canlau and the summer switchgrass types, similar amounts of carbon deposition, but really different usages by the different communities associated with those different um, genotypes. And you can see how that changes with soil depth with in the summer switchgrass, the saprophytic fungi being much more important. And then the Canlau, the gram negative bacteria. When we're trying again to, to detangle, what does this mean? Can we manage this for better carbon sequestration for enhanced ecosystem services? Again, that's four um, of our talks, four of our efforts, but I now wanna move into how do you interact with us and how can we interact together? The Natural Resources and Sustainable Agricultural Systems Division of ARS, um, we have locations at 55 of our 90 labs and you can see some of the numbers there. And then my national program, the Soil and Air National Program has 19 locations. And we invite participation from around the world around these soil questions. Then we have networks within the US and these are also expanding globally. Um, our GraceNet effort that's being um, reviewed currently right now for expansion, our LTAR network, our antibiotic resistance network that was spoken to before, our climate hubs, our biochar, our soil biology, our wind erosion network as well. Um, every year, I should say that again, every five years, each of our national programs goes through review. We have listening sessions and we um, have an opportunity for stakeholder input, um, national and international. This is a wonderful time to engage with us and have your inputs um, recorded and then how we respond to that in our next five-year plan. And the way you can do that is you can contact me. My in information is there. Um, but then I can also put you in touch with our other national program leaders across our groups. So I thank you for your attention. I realize that was fast, a little bit of a snapshot, but I, I really wish to engage more globally on these important questions for um, soil ecosystem understanding, management, and then what we can do to hopefully promote the ones we want to go forward with our um, better production, better climate resilience, better carbon sequestration. And I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nebel. Thank you very much for your presentation and for the overview of USDA activities. Thank you very much. And uh, I leave now the floor uh, to Mr. Ras, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, who is uh, presenting uh, um, a presentation titled A Coordinated Research Enterprise on Agricultural and Soil Microbiomes and Soil Ecosystems Across, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, so Mr. Ras, uh, um, understanding impact of soil biology on crops, the key to sustainability of farming systems. I'm sorry again, Mr. Ras, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Sorry, it will be Marie-Thérèse Gessler. Ah, okay, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Okay, Marie-Thérèse uh, okay. Gessler. Thank you. I had your name, sorry. Yes, hi everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, okay, great. Yes, we do. So, um, there you go. All right, so hi everyone. So in my presentation, I will show you how we work with farmers, farmer association and science to understand our impact on soil biology and why it is important. So this doesn't work. So a quick presentation, a quick introduction to myself. So I work with my father. Uh, he's a farmer in France for over 30 years now, and he's a consultant for farmers interested in conservation agriculture. I joined him now three years ago to develop the courses for farmers and the biological analysis we propose. So through my work and my interests, I could say I have kind of one feed in science and one feed in farming. And that's what we are going to show you today. So this is a little bit an example of uh, our work with farmers. We try to put together and sum up 
the findings by scientists or specialists or farmer pioneers to disseminate then these practices to other farmers who are willing to have sustainable soil management. Oops. So we do this uh, through courses, field days or individual consulting. So our goal as farmer is to improve our management to get healthy plants for and with healthy soils for healthy food. So we try to find new techniques. We get inspired from farmers all around the world, thanks to networking and internet. Um, and the new techniques also come from scientists and specialists like Kinsey, Christine Jones, John Kempf, Ingham, Pfeiffer, Don Wikowski, and a lot of other people. This way, we have a double competency in science and in agricultural systems. So theory and practice that we try to conciliate. We know the soil has been depleted with our way of farming, the tillage, plowing, chemicals and intensive production. The focus was always on quantity rather than quality, and this really has to change. But we farmers, we need tools to monitor what we are doing. We have the big principles. We know what we want to follow. So no-till, living plants, diversity, etc. But everyone has to find out a way to apply it to its own farm environment and conditions. Because every situation and every farm is different. Farming is an entire system that is influenced by the environment. So what is working out one year with one farmer isn't necessarily working out for his neighbor. And therefore, it is more than essential for every farmer and producer to check its, his impact on his own soils and production. So we try to give them tools. Some are pretty well known, like chemical analysis. But the last few years have highlighted the need to change our soil management and to take more into account the soil biology. So what we are talking about here. Therefore, we are using a tool that has yet to be more disseminated, and it's the soil chromatography. It has been developed in the early 50s with Pfeiffer, and then by the Lübcke family, who is now dispensing courses on how to do it and how to read it. Since then, as well as the last few years, some studies have been carried out, some colleagues consolidating the method, but some don't. So we try now at our farm to compare the results to an analysis with microscope and to chemical analysis. So the soil chem uh, chromatography is actually a simple way to get a lot of qualitative information on soil biology. The oxygen levels in the structure, the bacterial and the fungal analysis, uh, sorry, the bacterial and the fungal activity. And it's actually quite simple to read. If you have learned how to do it, you look at the color, the structures, and the different areas. To give you an easy example to understand, this is a stone, so it has no life in it, and this is a, a pasture, so it's biologically active. So now if you, if you keep these two pictures in mind for the next one, you see that even if you don't really know how to read it and what to look at, you see there are some differences. So these samples used were taken on a trial. Three samples, same sampling date, same field, same rotation, but different soil management. Even without knowing really what you have to look at, you can easily guess that the best one is the no-till and cover crop because the plowing really actually looks like uh, the stone we just saw. So this is one way we have today to look at what we are doing to our soil biology. And if you look at what it looks like on the soil, you have on the left the conven conventional tillage and on the right the conservation agriculture, so no-till and diversity. So the way of farming matters, and it is really important for us to be able to assess. We know the con concepts, we know we have to put life back into our soils and especially fungi. So we have to be able to check the biology in our soils and especially if it does work. 
as a farmer, I don't really know what to do with the information microbial biomass. I don't know if it is going to work to decompose organic matter, to create humus, to structure and to provide nutrition to my plants. It is important to look where we are and how it is evolving, even if I don't know exactly what is in my soil. I don't really care as a farmer as long as, is it, as, long as it is working and producing good plants. Thinking we are doing the right soil management isn't enough. We did our work at our farm, the first chromatography eight years ago. So we had around 15 years of conservation agriculture. Yes, it was the, be the beginning of it. And we did a lot of mistakes, but still we thought we should, should not be so bad. But well, we, little did we know. After 15 years of no-till and cover crops, we discovered that our soils weren't doing that good on the biological side. It didn't respond as we thought. There was a, lot, a big lack of diversity and fungi and air was missing in the structure. And three years later, we had big improvement. Even if not perfect, it was better because we were able to look at what we were doing. So what changed in those uh, three years? We tried to have always living plants on the field, food for biology, not only crop residues, but really living plants. And we got more interested in chemical analysis of soils and plants. That, that's what we were looking for, diversity of living plants all year round. And of course, this brings to the aspect of no-till. So there you have the three key principles of conservation agriculture with all the benefits around agronomy, environment, and economics. Of course, they have to be adapted, monitored, assessed, and farmers and consultants have to learn how to do it properly in their own regions. And that is why it is interesting to have the farmers associations. Why not with scientists or spe specialists to sum up what has to be done, what worked, what did not work, and why? We have to understand where we have to progress in order to give the right tools and management guidelines to all the other farmers. And this is where this agriculture gets interesting because you actually have, as a farmer, to think again what to do and how it is, and you need therefore to be able to check if you do right. So to, come, to sum up, the long-term aims, the goal, should be for the farmer associations to work hand in hand with science. We both sides have to or need to work together, science and, uh, and farmers. There is still a lot of work to do and we need to transform the scientific findings in agricultural practice useful for farmers. So please let's work together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the timeline. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks also for the interesting results and thank you. clearly exposed. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have um, uh, Ms. Uh, Costa from Portugal, uh, who is going to present uh, uh, soil functioning relates to land use in a sustainable manager Managed agro silver pastoral ecosystem. So, Ms. Costa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I've been thoroughly enjoying the previous talks. Um, um, so, before I start, I want to say I completely agree with Ms. Gassler and Mr. Joshi that we need to work together. I'm coming from a science perspective. Um, going to talk to you about soil functions um, as perceived through our bioindicators that we use um, in, a, in a sustainably managed um, agroecosystem combining agriculture, forestry and animal husbandry. Our study was conducted in the Barroso globally important agricultural heritage system uh, designated so by the FAO. It's the only globally important agricultural heritage system we have in Portugal, and it was one of the first ones established in Europe. Um, it's all revolving around production of 
the Barousin cow, that's beef cattle, that grazes freely in these meadows that we can see here. Um, this is a land, a typical land sharing regime. Uh, there's lots of ecological infrastructure around like these stone walls. This, um, these pastures are permanent pastures, maintained so throughout the winter, even in freezing conditions, because locals um, divert water from streams that you can see there. They divert them to, to circulate throughout the fields. This is all rain fed, but they keep this sort of um, traditional irrigation system in the pastures. Now the cattle is not outside all the time and it goes into stables. People collect shrubs from the forest, from the woody areas around here for animal bedding. And once that's used, then it gets composted in piles. And this compost with lots of um, manure uh, integrated, um, it's, it is spread in agricultural fields, so small fields for horticulture. Um, that people have been uh, using then to produce, you know, whatever horticultural crops for their families. So it's a nice closed, almost closed system where biomass is being transferred and nutrients are being tra transferred between the natural component, the pasture component, and the agriculture component of this agro ecosystem. Now this has been um, well characterized above ground. We know about how the system works in sustainability and resilience to impacts, biodiversity above ground, um, biodiversity of the flora in, this, in these meadows and the birds and all sorts. But we know very little about what's going on in the soil and how soil functions and soil biodiversity are being impacted, if at all, by these human activities in this um, sustainable agroecosystem. So as scientists, we did what scientists do. We went to the field and collected samples from the three different components. So we've got samples from the natural component, the pasture, and you can see it's flooded here. It's very easy to, maybe you can't see it very well, but it's sort of semi-flooded um, meadow marsh field and uh, agricultural plots. So it, we've sampled the three components and we were using nematodes as bioindicators, nematode communities as bioindicators of what's going on in the soil. We do this because um, you've been shown, uh, even in the symposium, actually even um, a few minutes ago, Ms. Gassler was, sh was showing you um, a soil food web diagram. And if you look at the soil food web, and this is a very simplified diagram, but no matter where you start, if you start with plants, you'll have nematodes feeding on plants. If you start with organic matter that is decomposed by fungi and bacteria, these are eaten by nematodes too. And the nematodes themselves are then preyed upon by other nematodes. So what this means is, you know, nematodes are everywhere. They're very abundant. They're very diverse in soil. Their, their response to impacts is very well characterized and they're in different trophic levels in the food web. And that means that if you know what's going on with nematodes, you know a lot about what's going on in, in, in soil functions, in soil processes. Now, if you go about characterizing your nematode communities in these uh, soil samples, you end up with a very large spreadsheet of data. And of course, you need to make sense of it to try to understand what's going on in your soil. Uh, and here we see in this plot, we've summarized the nematode communities of our agriculture, natural and pasture components into just one data point in this plot. And this plot is measuring food web complexity or food web structure and regulation points across the, the self-regulation or natural regulation of, of this complex food web and nutrient availability on the y-axis. So expectedly, it was nice to see that uh, in this sustainable system, all our data points for any of the components ended up in this part of the plot that combines structure, stability, complexity with nutrient availability. So these are overall stable systems. But if you go about looking at these areas, 
this is activity, these areas of these rhomboids uh, um, around the, the data points are areas of activity um, dedicated to structure or regulation or to enrichment. And you can see in the agricultural system, this is a very, it's, it's much smaller rhomboid. Uh, so much smaller activity, the least activity in structure in complexity. Um, and it's also not well balanced. You can see these green and um, blue rhomboids are sort of square-like, and this is more spindle or diamond shaped. This is an unbalanced system. So they're all very well, very fine, stable, but the agricultural system seems to have some problems in, in nutrient use efficiency. Still exploring the nematode information, you can um, know why, where the nutrients are allocated into the different levels of the soil food web. Um, and you can categorize then in this radar plot, you can look at where nutrients are allocated in pests and pathogens, and then in omnivores and predators, so higher trophic groups, and in decomposers. And these provide direct indications of the services provided by the soil. So you can see that uh, on the right hand side where you have the regulation services, those are more prominent in natural systems and in pastures. So there's more complexity there of the food web. And in the decomposition side of things, you can see that it's maybe all systems have a, a active decomposition, which is crucial in, in soil systems. Decomposition is a crucial service in re recycling and mineralizing nutrients trapped in organic matter so that they can be used by plants again. But as plants use these nutrients, of course, they, they grow and they produce lots of biomass. And that attracts pests and pathogens that then provide this herbivory disservice. OK, so. Um, if you look at the plot, then here we see that agricultural systems, um, agricultural components of these, uh, of these systems have more pest and pathogen pressure than all the other components. So um, interestingly, let me just go back. Um, interestingly, um, you see that pasture also has more. This, this is on a log scale, so this is magnitude. It's actually quite a difference from here to here. So pasture also has a lot of herbivory, but there's more regulation. And in agriculture, you don't have as much regulation. And that's probably why the pests and pathogens disservice is being uh, increased. So just to conclude, yes, there seems to be some mirroring below ground of what's going on above ground for sustainability. So my, keep in mind, all the three components were relatively stable. Um, although, yes, although perhaps in the agricultural system, um, because there's, there's more, um, there's, there's um, a lower nutrient use efficiency and less regulation, it's more prone to herbivory. Um, but keep in mind, this is the same system. When we're talking about what's going on above ground and below ground, we sometimes have this temptation that it, the separate systems, they're the same. And we need to keep that in mind when we are designing strategies for soil management. We need to design strategies that are aware of what's going on in the soil, but that are applied to the whole system. So I'm just... okay. Thanking my funding, I've added these <laughs> nematodes as part of the ecosystem as well. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your very clear presentation. Thanks a lot. And uh, <clears throat> we move now to the last presentation. We are in time, happily, and uh, uh, to the last presentation of the this uh, second slot and of our session also. And uh, I call uh, Mr. I'm not sure of the pronunciation, Kula Surya uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, who's giving a talk about the utilization of soil microbial diversity for crop production in Sri Lanka. And uh, is Mr. Kula Rosia. I'm sorry, and I beg your pardon for my pronunciation. You have the floor. I don't think she's here. <clears throat> she's not she had, here? No, she, she had trouble signing in. And uh, I don't think she managed. Is she? Well. 
Okay. Yeah, just missed the, in my agenda. Okay. I I tried to to work out with her, but I don't think she managed. Okay, for, for the time being, I I do not have specific questions, if I am correct. I have, uh, um, there's a couple of comments uh, on, uh, um, um, on uh, uh, yes, how the, uh, if there is uh, to everybody, I'm not, they're not specific, I don't know who of uh, you presenters want to answer. If there does exist uh, a, an overall indicator, a simple one, if I understand correctly this comment, um, that can be used uh, at, uh, at farm level, so cheap and uh, easy to, uh, to interpret. Um, because of course, uh, science is not so near to farmers, uh, especially in some uh, regions of the, of the world. So I don't know if there is uh, anyone uh, um, <clears throat> want to address this uh, comment. Can I um, comment on this, uh, Constanza? Um, yes. Um, yes, there, usually there isn't a single indicator that works. Uh, we are using nematodes as bioindicators and they do give us a lot of um, different uh, hints about what's going on, but usually it's best to select a few. Now, what we need to develop, and it's something that we need to do together as well, is to try to figure out, you know, we can go to the lab and do all sorts of analysis, and some are incredibly expensive, and others are cheap, and but they're time consuming. So we need to figure out um, some sort of correlation or relation between what we're observing in the lab and what we can observe in field, in the field that that correlates to those re same results so that we can we can yes we can take samples to the lab and try to provide mechanistic uh, um, information or uh, knowledge about what's going on but it's easier perhaps for day-to-day -day, um, following of the field conditions to to try to come up with something that you can observe in the field like Compa soil compaction, like th easy things like um, putting a, a wire through soil to assess compaction, looking at plants and turgescence of the leaves, something like that. We need to work together. Yeah. Sorry, maybe that doesn't help very much, but. No, no, but um, you're correct. Uh, they probably, uh, yes, I was a bit misunderstood. Is uh, not uh, only one, but in, uh, you know, uh, a general view. Yes, more holistic, let's say. And you, so thank you very much for your. Um, I'll, I'll add comments. Mr. That. Neville, um, yes. Um, thank you, Sophia. We agree. Um, it's um, there's so many different complexities of soils. We are trying to do two things. One is to work on tools that are regionally relevant, the different production systems in different parts of the world. Um, due to the soil and the climate, some different indicators will be more powerful than others. And so we've thought we could just sort of develop one standard set of suite of methods, but those always don't correlate well depending on the production system. And so within the Global Soil Partnership, there's a real interest in developing standard methods that can be used. And the suite of those have been proposed for the, the world through the UN FAO GSP. But yeah, coming to agreement on those and then what a farmer will trust and then what a farmer will be able to use to really make decisions. Uh, that's a real challenge. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to come together and have those dialogues and try to come to a closer solution. So I agree. Thank you for that, Sophia. Thank you. And there is another comment and another question overall about the the smell of the soil. So is, uh, is it, uh, 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 she knows farmers uh, who smell the soil uh, to assess uh, the overall quality. And uh, do you, does anyone know if the, uh, if and how the scent of the soil has uh, some information about biodiversity? 
quickly that that often has a correlation to the, the streptomyces and actinomyces, the geosmin odor that you often yeah. smell when you take that. But boy, that's a great question. And if there was a simple handheld gas chromatograph, we could, we could correlate when you do disrupt the soil and what volatiles are being re released. Um, my knowledge, I don't know if that's been examined. It's often looking at color or compaction or other tools. Um, interesting topic, if, if we could develop something simple for that. Uh. I uh, I don't know. There is a, a comment about the relations uh, with plants, but I'm not sure that I understand correctly. Um, uh, so about analysis of soils versus the plants. Uh, yes, there was also another comment about uh, uh, about uh, the uh, chromo chromography for also for plants. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't. I'm not sure that I understand correctly the sense of the of the question. Yes, of course, the microbiome is uh, is correlated to the production of biomass. So, finally, to the photosynthesis. I don't know if there is uh, any particular uh, research or study from your side uh, linking. Uh, vegetation and plant uh, characteristics to soil biodiversity. Um, if no one's commenting, maybe I can add a little bit on that. <laughs> uh, even from um, Wim van der Putten's work, and he was presenting on the plenary session yesterday. Um, it seems that um, overall crop diversity, not just yeah, yeah not just uh, diversity yeah. of crops that you're growing, but the diversity, the genetic diversity, diversity and adaptation of the crop itself seems to be important in promoting, uh, in interacting with the rhizosphere microorganisms, whatever they may be, you know, microbes or even insects and sort of mesofauna. Um, the more diverse uh, plant above ground community that you can see above ground, that means different roots below ground as well. And that means different specificities of food for, for what's below ground as well, for all these microbial, for all these um, um, organisms in the rhizosphere that have, or they're, they're very, it's, it's a redundant, usually perceived as redundant community in every, anything can be done by lots of different organisms, but usually they're very specific. They can have food preferences. The more diverse your crops, the more diverse the food will be for all these organisms, the more complex and long food chains you can have, the more natural regulation you can have. And that leads to the over yielding effect that you can, if you Google it, over yielding effect by diversity, by crop diversity. Yeah, there is uh, the, uh, a question, I think, uh, um, uh, for uh, um, uh, Ms. Gessler, because it's about uh, soil chromat chromatography. Uh, and uh, um, she asks if, if it's are appropriate for general public farmers with training. Uh, probably in your presentation, you said something similar, but if you want to add something. Yes, so um, I'm not sure I did understand the question right, but I'm going to say uh, we use the chromatography to uh, look at the impacts of our practices on our farm and we propose this analysis to other farmers who would like to uh, use better soil management practices. So we use it to, um, as a tool for consulting um yeah i don't know if it is no uh, okay question. the question was Sorry. if uh, the 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 farmer need require reagents or a, a lab setting to do chromatography yes oh I think sorry they do uh no actually it's uh, quite simple um okay. ourselves we are just farmers well just farmers uh we don't have a lab we just learn well, you just learned how to do it and how to read it and then if you if you do it right, 
I, I would say everyone can do it if he learns how to do it. Thank you. Uh, and another question for you, where can we learn more about how you interpret your results? Uh, um, yeah, so we did a lot of courses with the uh, Lübcke family in uh, Austria. I say it right. Uh, you can find some uh, paperwork about it. There's a lot of paperwork in uh, German and a lot of paperwork that is not using the right interpretation or like it's, uh, it's learned by the Lübcke family. So I would say the best is to look at the work of Pfeiffer or the work at the Lübcke, from the Lübcke family. Um. Oh, we have someone who, Karsten, is, uh, he raised his hand. Oh, sorry. Give him the floor. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry, I was looking at the chat. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for giving me the uh, audience. Uh, you see, the uh, uh, question, what is the situation of the soil, can be always studied directly by your senses. So I have a five uh, step uh, sense proof of the soil. And I do this in Africa or Asia or South America, everywhere I, uh, I am in uh, projects. The first you are doing is to take a look around. Where are you? Landscape, all the things, you have to be aware of this second one you take a look directly on the soil in front of you. Third step, you touch it with your hand. You feel something like warmth, like uh, humidity, things like this. It's a, it's, you trust your senses. Then you go inside the, the soil with your hand. How deep can you go? You know, the most important, what we need in the soil this is not to be trained in the schools and university. This is air in the soil because there's no life without air in the soil. Even if you have anaerobic living beings, of course, you don't want to have them for the plant uh, cultivation. So then you, when you are inside, you can see, you can differ it, the, the sense of touching it just uh, on front of the soil, or if you go inside to get something of warmth, something like this is uh, away from your, your eye senses. And then you take it and take it out and smell it. You can smell everything. You can learn this, trust your senses, I would like to say. Second, all this picture forming methods, they will prove your senses. So for me, the first one is prove it by your own senses. Second step with picture form and method. And third step analysis, like having it down to the uh, DNA or everything you would like to have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I have to, to, to stop now with the conversation. I have two other hands. Uh, I will come later because we have the, uh, the presentation, the, uh, foreseen presentation, plan the presentation from, from Ananda Pula Zoria uh, from uh, Sri Lanka. She should have reached the meeting. And, uh, and uh, is that correct, colleagues from FAO? Is she in? Yes, is she in? So please, uh, Ananda. Go ahead. So the the title is Utilization of Soil Microbial Diverse Diversity for Crop Production in Sri Lanka. Ananda, are you there? I'm uh, I am still trying to connect. Okay. Am I am I in? I don't see my name, I don't see myself. We see you. I'm trying my best to connect for the last one hour. Um, I don't know why, 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 what happened? 
I can hear you. I can hear you. You but, uh, can or you I, cannot? I can hear you. And we can hear you. Rami, man, you got to cut that card now. Maybe Oh, oh, oh! You got to know. Have a pin. Make it. Can I start sharing the presentation? Maybe. We see you, Ananda. I, I am sorry. Uh, with, uh, in these days, uh, everything is not very easy. Ananda, can you unmute yourself? Is, uh, is he un unmuted, uh, Julia? Okay. Yes. Uh, I mean, he can unmute himself if he wishes to do so. Um, okay, now I can see my presentation and my picture. Can, can you all see me? Thank you very much. Sorry for the what happening. You have uh, 10 minutes for your talk and I will uh, recall you I, at nine minutes no, that you are I, near the front. Yeah. Can you all can you all see me or you cannot? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Go so, ahead, please. Uh, my presentation has come. So shall I start? Yes. Okay. Is it, can you see my presentation on the screen? Yes. Can you hear us? Uh, we can, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Greetings from Sri Lanka. Presentation. On behalf of the National Institute of Fundamental Studies, Sri Lanka, together with my colleague, Professor Gamini Seneviratna. And uh, we are going to talk on the utilization of soil microbial diversity for crop production in Sri Lanka. These are our own experimental work that has been going on. Uh, oh. Can I pass the slide? Uh, yeah, I, I want to change the slide. It's not. Yeah, just, just ask me and I'll do it. Uh, let me see. It's not working. Uh, yeah. OK, fertilizers and soil fertility. Thank you for helping. You might have to do that, continue to do that. Well, we all need that short term crops, which are called annuals, uh, have to be given a rapid supply of nutrients. And this, of course, needs uh, is satisfied by applying chemical fertilizers, nit particularly nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. However, the continuous use of such fertilizers have not given sustainable high yields, but on the other hand, led to environmental pollution, which had resulted in an increase in environmental health problems. This is happening in our country as well. So it's therefore necessary to explore the alternatives that are available for eco-friendly agriculture. And that is what this is presentation is all about. Next slide, please. I cannot take it from here if you can. Yeah, thank you. Now the Sri Lankan scenario is that we don't produce any fer chemical fertilizers at all. We import all our fertilizers and also provide it to farmers under a heavy subsidy for political reasons. As a result, in fact, now the fertilizer, uh, fertilizers are given free to farmers. So this has led to excessive use of fertilizer and increased environmental related health problems like chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and blue baby syndrome. The government has therefore now realized the and they are looking for alternatives. And the, this presentation reports on our efforts at the NIFS, National Institute of Fundamental Studies, to provide biofertilizer, so bioinoculants, as an alternative to chemical fertilizer. Next slide, please. 
Now, what are biofertilizers? They are different from all the other conventional fertilizers because they do not provide nutrients to plants from their biomasses, or they do not live as substrates. They are live microbial entities that grow with the host and obtain nutrients from other substrates. For instance, if you take nitrogen fixing microorganisms or uh, legume rhizobia, they obtain nitrogen from the air, from an outside substrate, convert it and provide it to the plant. So biofertilizers are live microbial inoculants. And this presentation will de describe our efforts on developing rhizobial biofertilizers for legumes and biofilm biofertilizers for other crops, including plantation crops. The next slide, please. Now here the methodology was, of course, I can rush through this because it's conventional. We isolate the rhizobia on uh, standard media and then purify them. Uh, then, on the other hand, for the other non-legume crops, including rice, corn, and other uh, vegetables, non-legume, uh, that is something novel that the NIFS developed. My colleague, Professor Garmini Seneviratna, he developed multimicrobial biofilm biofertilizer. In other words, fungi and bacteria isolated from soil were put together in specific media to form biofilms, and these are used as inoculants. They associated, associate themselves intimately with the root systems of plants, of targeted crop plants, and increase the nutrient use efficiency tremendously. In this manner, it has been shown that they, we can reduce 50%, at least 50% of chemical fertilizer use all three major chemicals, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And all these isolates came from Sri Lankan indigenous soil microbiodiversity. The next slide, please. Well, this is a quick glance through the system where you see the isolated rhizobia, semi-mass culture, packeting them in sterilizable, autoclavable uh, carrier material, which is coconut, Royal dust coming from the coconut industry, which is available very cheap in Sri Lanka. And then they are covered in commercially attractive covers. This is particularly showing the, this is for vegetable beans. Similarly, we have for soybean, mung bean, and other. This is all what the farmer has to do is to take the seeds that he's planting and cover it with the, the covered or coat the seeds in the carrier-based uh, rhizobium inoculant, and then the farmers themselves plant the seeds under our guidance. That is how it went on, how we popularized it among the farmers uh, in the field. Next slide, please. This is uh, the same thing we are testing with vegetable beans, Fasciolus vulgaris, and groundnut Arachis hypogea laying out the fields, vegetative state, and this is uh, the work, similar work done with farmers in the, we get the farmers to do work under our guidance so that if the work is successful, if the experiments are successful, the farmers take it up very quickly, unlike doing demonstration trials ourselves. Next slide, please. This is, of course, we also introduce our inoculants for a forage crop crover, which is of course done all over the world, but for the Sri Lankan scenario, it was the first time that these are the coated seedling, uh, clover seeds and machine applied. And then once the crop is grown and a crop cut harvest is obtained, we do, the, we straight away spray the, uh, the, the inoculant grown as a liquid fertilizer. Next slide, please. Here are the results we are going to show. Next slide. This is, this all these experiments, the department, government department of agriculture conducted the field experiments using our rhizobial inoculant for soybean. 
this slide show and they gave us this photograph which they themselves took it was a very successful work and all the locations showed a luxuriant growth of soybean and and profuse nodulation here is the root system with so many nodules per plant some of these plants carried more than 100 nodules so they were very effective in terms of inoculation next slide please this is with uh, vegetable beans these are the inoculate plants growing beautifully and these three locations hangurangeta rikilagaskada and doragala of course these uh, are three locations in the central mountain regions the red column shows the yield in terms of chemical fertilizers added green column shows inoculation the with inoculation without chemical without chemical nitrogen this is the control same three here and in this case you see the the iser response to nitrogen whether it is added as chemical or as inoculant but the inoculant yield is marginally statistically may be the same marginally about the chemical anyway this means that there is a potential for these inoculants to replace the use of nitrogen chemical fertilizer completely you can replace 100% next slide please excuse me you have just one minute for conclusion no, so if I'm you sorry, can I skip to, to the main conclusions it is the same thing it shows that <laughs> thank slide, you please. next slide please this is with vegetable bean this is with groundnut all this next one i think i i want to rush through to the next one biofilms this biofilm biofertilizer where for rice here this is this massive growth with the biofilm and comparatively less growth with chemicals next slide please these are the statistical here we got with biofilms 2370 average kilogram so acre as compared to with chemical fertilizer 1916 average in 82 locations filter has done and now next slide please the government has accepted this is with the maize next slide please with biofilms you get and carrot potato strawberry all these gave with biofilm biofertilizer you should reduce you can reduce the application of chemical fertilizer all three npk by 50% without any loss in fact slight increase in yield and with rice we are having fantastic results next slide please uh so this is with tea next slide we can skip through because our time restraint we are conclude rhizobium biofertilizer are supplied annually now for about 10000 acres of legumes our country doesn't grow so much of legumes and biofilm biofertilizers have been very successful field trials amounting to 15000 acres done with rice in 80 locations and the government uh, this this season we are going up to 100000 acres and the government has approved providing biofilm biofertilizers to rice farmers under the fertilizer subsidy scheme so even the biofertilizers are not going to be given to the farmers under a subsidy this means that biofertilizers can be recommended with confidence for low cost eco friendly agriculture and support the government's efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals of the united nations reducing nitrogen fertilizer by 50% and other fertilizers very easily thank you very much for your kind attention i am sorry for rushing but we have <laughs> finished our our slot time and i think that uh, Uh, the Zoom mechanism is quite rigid in control. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very exhaustive, and I'm sorry that uh, we have uh, no much, much time. Not not no more time for discussion. And uh, so I, if uh, uh, well, I, I want to thank all the speakers for the. Uh, Teach, uh, <clears throat> for your presentation, they were very interesting and very, um, uh, very different each from each other, which is which is very interesting. And uh, so I, I thank you all, all the attendants, and 
and I beg your pardon for the this uh, some some technical problems, but we are dealing with this uh, Zoom machines and uh, all the connection from all over the world. So thank you again, and uh, stay connected with uh, uh, Global Soil Biodiversity. Thank, thank you, you very much for moderating the session. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I see you in the next day's uh, Exorbit 2021. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks to the speakers and thank to the attendance. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye.